I'm Marcel, I write to blog Lesser Known Gems and welcome to the two Potter of my mathematics and literature. Today we're going to talk about Alice in Wonderland. Now, it may be surprising to a lot of you that Alice in Wonderland actually has to do with mathematics. Now, a lot of you might know how the Reverend Charles Dodger uh, wrote Alice in Underland to Alice the Little. But the reason why people started to question whether or not uh, Alice in Wonderland had anything to do with mathematics was when they saw the comparison between the story he wrote to Alice uh, Little, which was Alice in Underland, and the book published, which was Alice in Wonderland. And it's not just the names that were different, there were a lot of different uh, topics and different scenes in this book that wasn't in the original. The original article where this was discussed was written by Melanie Bailey and I'll link her article in the description so you can go and read that for full because she talks about all the different scenes uh, point for point and it's not really, there's no point for me to do the same. But what I kind of liked her idea in presenting it, because you have to remember that Charles Dodgen, was what, who was the real name of uh, Carol Lewis, was a mathematician. And one of her big arguments isn't just that uh, he was a huge fan of Euclid mathematics, but he talked most vividly about mathematics, much more than when he talked about anything else, which was kind of dreary. Uh, and of course, when, when the book is so vividly talked about, she says that, that it gives an idea that maybe this book is about mathematics itself. Now, this came out in the 1800s, and what was happening in the 1800s was there became a huge discussion between Euclid and non-Euclid geometry or, or mathematics. And what was happening was that Euclid geometry, which is what you probably think about when thinking about mathematics, which is about 1 plus 1 equals 2, or every angle in a triangle equals, equals 180 degrees. And this has to do with the fact that there are certain rules, certain axioms, as they're called, that you don't question. You just, this is how it is, 1 plus 1 equals 2, and then we just assume everything else based on it. And what was happening then in the 1800s was that people were questioning if that was actually true, if maybe there weren't these rules, they, these rules weren't what they were saying that they were. And so, some sort of so this, you got sort of a divide within the mathematic community in the sense that some were saying, "Well, maybe we can question it. Maybe there is a four dimension, not just three. Maybe there are no rules at all." And this wasn't just something that was happened within mathematics, but also things that are happening within art. You, for example, have. A Flatland by Edwin Abbott Abbott, where he plays with both Euclid and non-Euclid uh, mathematics and geometry to both satirize uh, society today, but also questioning both things within uh, mathematics, but also how we view the world. Because that's some of the aspects of it, that because of Euclid mathematics, you had a sense that everything is bound by rules, everything is set, everything is in order, that's how the world works. Uh, and you sort of have uh, books like that, and you also have artists like Picasso. If you've ever seen a picture by Picasso, you'll see that it, it looks strange, and that's because he plays with both two and three dimensional paintings. So he mixes them up in the sense of saying, well, because non-Euclid mathematicians say that maybe there aren't a separation, I can actually play with it. And that's one of the reasons you got to cubism. But 
Carol Lewis, on the other hand, was a firm believer in Euclid mathematics. He liked order, he liked rules, he was saying that this non-Euclid mathematics was some newfound humbug that were ruining everything, it was becoming a mad world, it was becoming Wonderland. So you do have uh, the rules in the madness, but it's first and foremost madness, and it's a madness where you don't know the rules, how they are and how they react. And, and you also have to question, are there really re rules in the madness? Uh, one example, one scene that uh, she talks about in her article is uh, the scene with the caterpillar. And, for, uh, and the caterpillar says to Alice, you have to remember to keep your temper. And that has been uh, assumed that, okay, that means that you have to be calm, you have, don't have to be angry, can't really be angry. But temper within mathematics has to do with things keeping their proportions. So, for example, if you are baking and you use uh, one deciliter of milk and two eggs, and you're going to say, I need twice as much dough, you need to double both of them for it to still be the same. So if you, for example, have twice the amount of milk, but three times the amount of eggs, you're not going to get twice amount of the same recipe. You're going to get something that's much more eggy. And in the caterpillar scene, for example, she has this mushroom and one uh, makes her bigger and one makes her smaller. And she takes a bite of the mushroom and it gets stuck in her throat. And suddenly her, her throat is so much bigger and she's mistaken for a snake. And that's a way you're sort of losing your temper because her neck is no longer in proportion to the rest of her body. While when she sort of swallows it and her entire body becomes big, her neck becomes then again in proportion to her body, even if it's now much bigger. So in that sense, you're sort of talking about how here he's saying, well, we have to be in temple. We have to keep things in proportion. We can't just do whatever we want because then you will end up like Alice with a throat like a snake instead of just a throat that is much bigger because the rest of her body is much bigger. And it's also interesting, of course, because if you both read um, the first one and the second one, Alice in Wonderland and also Alice Through the Looking Glass, you can't mistake to see all the parallels to games in the book. Uh, in the first one, you have ga uh, introductions to card games, for example. You're talking about the Queen of Hearts, the Jack of Hearts, and the introduction to the book. Now, I'm going to, uh, in my book, has the original drawings by Sir John Pennell. And the book, uh, as to the looking glass opens up with drawings of a chess game. And what's so interesting about both chess and card games in general is that those are games where you use mathematics, but that requires that the rules are there and simple and in order, that you know that the pieces can only move a certain way because otherwise it isn't a game anymore and that's also an interesting side of it it is how he sort of uses these mathematical games that require rules to in a way highlight how we need rules in a world especially a world that is such full of madness as Wonderland is and I know that not necessarily everyone reads the book this way. I read a book like why. I thought that when I read that article, everything made sense in why I enjoyed this book so much. And it sort of shows how understanding 
that this might be a, a critique of mathematics and what it is a critique of highlights why the madness in Wonderland is considered something bad. It's not necessarily just because it's unknown. He's clearly stating that this is bad because non-Euclid mathematics is bad. And therefore we understand the world better and the book better because of that very clear rule. So I would really like to uh, be interested to say, if you've read Alice in Wonderland, did you understand it the same way as Bailey and I do? Do you sort of understand it as a critique of non-Euclid mathematics and a call for rules and distinction in a world that is trying to induce and endorse madness? Or are you more into the theories that it's a book about uh, puberty and about the changes that we have to endure to go from a young girl to a young woman, which is another way of reading the book, and where changes is a necessity rather than something that we shouldn't have, which is how you would read it with regard to non-Euclid mathematics. So please leave me a comment down below and remember, it's better to be a witty fool than a foolish wit.